Uh, on behalf of the Global Home Education Exchange Council, I'd like to welcome you to today's session, uh, How to Defend Homeschoolers in Court. My name is Mike Donnelly. I'm a senior counsel with HSLDA and a member of the board of the Global Home Education Exchange Council, and I'll be moderating the discussion today. Uh, the series is a project of the Global Home Education Exchange Council Outreach and Advocacy Committees, and I want to thank Peter Stock, who is the chair of the Outreach Committee. Uh, he is also the president of HSLDA of Canada, who's helped me put this series together. I also want to thank our staff uh, who supported pulling this together and letting you know about it. Our goal for this series is to help you as a leader or as a lawyer, we have some lawyers and leaders in the audience, in your country to support the development of a free and flourishing homeschool community. Uh, our vision is to see homeschooling recognized as a human right, regardless of motivation or methodology. We believe everyone everywhere should have easy access to home education without undue burden from the government. We believe home education is a natural, fundamental, and inalienable human right. To support the global home educating community, uh, GHEX works to connect leaders, to support research, and to influence policy. You can visit ghex.world for more information. I'm very excited about our discussion today. It's very timely, uh, defending home education in the court of law, and I want to thank our speakers. Today, we're planning to have six speakers. Uh, each speaker will make their remarks, and at the end of the session, we'll have open discussion and Q&A. Uh, the exception is that for Mike Ferris, who's with us, he um, will be taking the first 45 minutes, and he has an event he has to go to. Uh, after his remarks, we'll have a period of discussion and questions for Mike. You can chat uh, in the chat box, uh, but please use the Q&A function at the bottom menu screen of your screen there to submit questions that you would like answered, and we'll try to get to your questions. We are recording the session, so it will be available for future access. Uh, and I know many people wanted to be here and have registered, but may not be able to be here for the live event. Let, allow me to begin this webinar with some brief introductory remarks to establish a little bit of context, and then I'm gonna introduce Mike and then our guests individually. So international law recognizes the crucial rights of parents in the education of their children as among the most important of all rights. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights says in Article 26.3 that parents have a prior right to decide what kind of education their children shall receive. And in Article 16.3, it says that family is the fundamental group unit of society. Uh, the ICCPR and ICESCR are two fundamental treaties on human rights in the international legal system, enshrine the rights of parents to choose an education for their children that conforms with the religious and philosophical convictions of the parents. I would note that the European Charter of Fundamental Rights also recognizes this and adds pedagogical convictions to the protected right. Many countries protect this right in law, but there are still many to whom homeschooling is kind of a new concept and they don't recognize it in law specifically. Because of the pandemic, billions of parents were forced to grapple with educating their children at home. Many did not like what schools offered and so they chose to continue homeschooling, where the parent directs the education of their children. In the United States alone, homeschooling has at least doubled and may have tripled from its pre-pandemic level of about 2 million children, which was about 3 or 4% of the school age population, to perhaps as many as 6 or more million children, about 8 to 10% of the school age population. And because of this, many countries are facing the need to develop policies for homeschooling in their countries. Some countries have responded by respecting these rights and recognizing them in law. For example, Panama earlier this year passed a pretty good law for homeschooling, whereas others have moved to restrict home education. For example, France. In my role at HSLDA, I'm privileged to work with national leaders to support them with advice and advocacy. Later this week, I'll meet with the Minister of Education of Trinidad and Tobago, an influential country in the Caribbean, to discuss policies that they're making. To support the growth of the global homeschooling community, GHEX is working to improve the network and resources of homeschooling leaders for mutual support, working with researchers to encourage insightful and useful research, and policymakers to inform and influence them to respect these rights. The goal of this series is to encourage the formation of national homeschool legal defense organizations, and this session to discuss specifically litigation. In virtually all countries, defending a homeschooler in court will require the services of a competent and licensed lawyer. Uh, Mike, maybe you can throw a lawyer joke at us later here, but, but there is much more to this question than just finding a lawyer. As you're grappling with the question of defending homeschoolers and homeschooling in court, what kind of lawyer should you look for? 
How do you know when and how to litigate, knowing that a case may have broad implications and a loss may affect many more than just the family in the case? And Lizzie Trofton is going to talk about uh, a case just like that in the UK that came out this week. So this is a very timely webinar. And perhaps not every case should go to court, but sometimes you don't have a choice. If a homeschooler is in court, as Jose Romalo from Portugal knows, they need to be defended. What are some of the best arguments that can be used? What are some successful or unsuccessful arguments? How should we see litigation in the larger context of advocacy for home education? What about international tribunals? We'll be hearing from Lorcan Price on that in a little while. How does national litigation feed into international litigation and should we even consider that? There are so many more questions that our guests will grapple with today. So with that, I'd like to introduce Mike Ferris. Uh, Mike Ferris is the president and CEO of the Alliance Defending Freedom. He was the founding president of both the Homeschool Legal Defense Association, who I work for, and Patrick Henry College, and serves as the chairman of the board of HSLDA and chancellor emeritus of Patrick Henry College. Mike has a Juris Doctorate from Gonzaga School of Law and a LLM in International Law from the University of London. Mike is a constitutional appellate litigator in the US, among other things, an author as well, has written many books, and is argued before the appellate courts of 13 states, eight federal circuit courts of appeal, and the United States Supreme Court. Mike is a homeschooling parent, his wife Vicki, uh, and he have 10 children, and many grandchildren. And it's been a privilege for me, Mike, to, to have worked for you these many years as, and I consider you a mentor uh, and I really appreciate you. So Mike, please share with us your decades of experience uh, and insight on these important questions. Mike Ferris, thank you. Thank you, Mike. <clears throat> it is good to be with you. I uh, guess I'm obligated to tell you a lawyer joke, but- uh, uh, No, you don't have to if you don't want to. Actually, there are only two lawyer jokes, all the rest are true stories. So, um, the uh, we'll just we'll su let that suffice. I, I wanted to share um, some lessons that I've learned through it, it's getting close to almost 40 years that I uh, since I started HSLDA, it's 38 years ago. Uh, and so the uh, some litigation lessons and some organizational lessons since the question before us is uh, is designed to help, various countries start nationally based homeschool legal organizations. Uh, I, I wanna talk about both litigation and, and organizational ideas. <clears throat> so um, the first uh, question I'll, I'll begin with is why did I start Homeschool Legal Defense Association? And, and this requires a little bit of background. Um, my wife and I uh, began homeschooling our, our kids when, um, well, we made the decision when our oldest child, Christy, was uh, in, it was April of her year first grade. Uh, so she was uh, six years old and she had been in kindergarten and in first grade in a Christian school. And we heard about homeschooling and we decided we were going to do that starting the next year. We, we went ahead and finished the, the year of another couple of months in, in the Christian school. And then we began homeschooling. Um, I was um, very active in basically precursor kind of organizations to Alliance Defending Freedom in, in Washington State at the time and had a um, statewide recognition, mainly among Christians, but to some degree in the, in the general public. Um, and the um, word got around that this Christian lawyer who does constitutional litigation uh, was now a homeschool dad. And so I started getting a, a fair number of, of requests for legal help. Uh, in the homeschooling context. And when people would say, that, well, they wanted a Christian lawyer to help them, what they really meant is they wanted a free lawyer. And, and so uh, Christian lawyer was simply uh, a shorthand way of saying, you need to do this for free. And I realized pretty quickly that this was a good way to go broke. Uh, and uh, that the, it wasn't realistic for people to expect, especially with something that appeared to be growing like homeschooling was, um, for, for it to work uh, very well if <clears throat> uh, it was all free. On the other hand, um, very few people can afford to pay for the full freight of legal services it would take to do constitutional litigation. And that was what was needed uh, in the early days of, of, of American homeschooling, still is needed too some considerable degree. 
And so the only way to get both effective lawyering and affordable lawyering was to effectively start a union for homeschoolers. And, and that's how HSLDA began is with the concept that we were forming effectively a parents union uh, to stand together. And so uh, we began and uh, it got going slowly and it, it took about three years for the number of members to reach sufficient critical mass that I could even come to work for, for HSLDA uh, on any kind of, uh, you know, I, I didn't get paid for the first two years. I was just a volunteer. It was still in the organizing uh, stage. Fortunately, I worked for um, Tim and Bev LaHaye during that period of time. And uh, Bev was the head of Concerned Women for America. And I was doing ADF kind of work through them. And um, it was, uh, uh, you know, very friendly. They, they, they liked, I mean, their daughter was homeschooling. They liked the idea. So they were very supportive of, of me doing this on the side. Um, <clears throat> but after about three years, it, it grew to the, uh, both the financial size and the need side that I could come to work full time. Now, in the, in the meantime, we had some uh, first a part time lawyer, Jordan Lawrence, and then a full time uh, First, a, a law clerk, Chris Glicka, and then he became a lawyer eventually. And, uh, and so Chris was there working at HSLDA, but then I, I, I was there full time myself. And so that took a while to, to get going. And so in, in the process of you know, thinking of starting something, uh, you, you, there's going to be a, an on-ramp kind of an experience. It will take a little while to get it built up. But you know, if, there's, if there's ways that you can... Um, do it incrementally, that's a good thing. Um, but the, the first lesson is that if you're going to bring successful legal defense to homeschooling, we've got to organize homeschoolers and we've got to agree to stand together. That's the only way it works. And, and so um, the second thing, moving to litigation strategy, um, I don't know that I was, was aware of this in a uh, kind of a, uh, a, a, a conscious sense. I, I think I was subconsciously aware of, of what I'm about to share from the very beginning, from my very first cases, but it, it, it later became very clear to me as to what the deal is. Uh, in American constitutional law, the formal burdens of proof are on the government. Uh, when, when you make a constitutional claim, uh, well, the, 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 the person has a, a burden of showing a couple of things as a preliminary matter. But the, where the real clash is, the governments um, have the burden of proof of that their interest is compelling is the way we, we talk about it, and that this is the uh, least restrictive alternative or it's narrowly tailored. Those are two ways of saying essentially the same concept. And so, and the government's supposed to have the burden of proof on both of those things. So what I learned is regardless of the formal burdens of proof, they're supposed to be followed by judges until the judge felt like the kids in front of them were okay academically. It didn't really matter what the formal burdens of proof were. And so I went into every case recognizing that the first thing I have to do is assure this judge that these kids are okay. And once the, the, the judge was, was certain that these kids were okay, then, um, it became a lot easier. It doesn't mean it didn't mean we we're going to win per se, but without it, it did mean we we're going to lose. And so the only open door for victory was to make sure that the judge felt that the kids were okay. And there were, you know, two basic ways uh, to accomplish that in in a shorthand fashion. Either we had the the uh, 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 some kind of a standardized test administered that would show the judge that the kids were doing fine. Um, even, you know, even if the law didn't require it, you know, we would have someone qualified to administer this test. Not, no one from the public schools, but someone you know, that we had, uh, we either HSLDA or the family had retained to administer uh, an appropriate standardized test. And, and through that method, show that the kids were okay. The other way to do it, in a quick fashion is to get a, a person with a, a proper educational background that couldn't be disputed by anybody reasonably, you know, 
uh, someone who had been a, a teacher in the public schools or an administrator in the public schools or you know, had a master's degree or you know, some, some set of credentials that would make their opinion readily uh, credible. Um, review the family's situation independent of the government and simply write a report that the, the kids were okay. Um, you know, and, you know, give an assessment of that that the children were were doing fine. And so, when I had when I, armed with that kind of information, um, it really it was critical to disarm the judges um, because um, there's just no getting around the fact that you put a, a case uh, of educational concern in front of any judge, you know, frankly, probably any place in the world, their first question is going to be in their heart. Are these kids okay? And you you just have to deal with that right at the outset. The second thing, and, and this is to some degree the legislative side of things, but it it, it spills off into litigation as well. Um, but I, I'm going to approach the, the the question from a from a legislative perspective, and that is, I found it to be incredibly important that uh, every member of the legislature or what's often called a parliamentarian, depending on your, your frame of government, that every parliamentarian actually knows a real homeschool family, uh, preferably from their district, so that they're never voting about a homeschool matter in the abstract. Uh, I, I want them thinking about an actual couple. Um, and, and the couple that, that uh, made me aware of this principle their, their names are Joe and Zan Tyler, uh, and they live in South Carolina. And uh, the way I discovered it is I was in the South Carolina legislature working on something, and um, I was talking to a legislator about homeschoolers. And he, and he said, I don't think about homeschoolers. I think about Joe and Zan Tyler. And so when I'm voting, I'm voting either for or against Joe and Zan. And that just, you know, turned a light on for me that it's extremely uh, important, uh, and, and the, um, a corollary to that is that if at all possible, homeschoolers need to, not, to be open about who they are and what they're doing, that, um, uh, you know, to their neighbors, to everybody, because public opinion will ultimately change litigation, public op opinion will ultimately change, um, Legislation, both. I mean, uh, our, our ADF's case, the Jack Phillips case, Masterpiece Cake Shop, pretty well known worldwide. And, and we just absolutely were convinced, and it tr proved to be true, that we had to convince the public of, of this idea. Uh, Jack Phillips serves all people. He, he, he will not deny gay people services, but he does not deliver all messages. And that one sentence, um, uh, there were national opinion polls, showed change public opinion about these things by about five or six percentage points, moved in Jack's direction by that. And it carried the Supreme Court seven to two, where everybody thought we were going to lose five, four. Uh, and so, um, so uh, the, in the same way, when, when most Americans began to believe that they knew some homeschoolers and they thought they were good people, that spilled over into to courtroom success, and that spilled over into legislative success as well. And so, making sure that you're good neighbors, that you, uh, that your legislator, your parliamentarian gets to know you, I think is a crucial strategy uh, for you know for the holistic uh, role of the movement in, in that regard. The um, um, fourth point I want to talk about is the various uh, components of the homeschooling movement. And Mike, the way you uh, outlined this and the, the framing of GX, GHEX, and I was at the first couple of GHEX G -H -E -X, uh, meetings uh, in uh, Berlin, and there was another one, I don't remember where the other one was, but uh, uh, I was at the first couple. And the uh, GHEX is aligned with the principles I'm going to say, and that is, it's a mistake for Christian homeschoolers to, in, the, in this context, in the context of standing up for each other's rights. Christian homeschoolers should not 
be standoffish to secular homeschoolers. We need to stand with each other. And um, so it's a mistake for Christians to say, no, we're only going to stay, stay together and we're only going to defend the right of Christian homeschoolers. It's also a mistake for secular homeschoolers to require Christians to leave their faith at the door when we're talking about these things. We need to let each, well, there's not just two sides, but you know, there's a continuum of homeschooling beliefs. And so we need to let all of us um, let each other be each other. You know, let us be who we really are and, and, and not say to the, uh, anybody that the price of entry into the room is to leave who you really are at the door. It just it won't work. Um, and so, um, so there has to be, you know, this is often said in the free speech context. Um, I may disagree with everything you say, but I'll defend to the death your right to say it. Well, the same principle is true here in homeschooling. I may have a different approach to edu home education. I may have a different philosophical reason for wanting to homeschool, but we, we just say, none of that matters. We're gonna defend to the nth degree each other's right to homeschool. And, and that camaraderie, that sense of, of unity on these questions is, is essential. Um, now, having said that, I do want to say a word to my fellow homeschoolers as my last point, and I'm going to be uh, my, my, my fellow Christian homeschoolers in particular, and that is uh, don't neglect your duty to pray and, and the duty of faith in this arena. Uh, faith and prayer are absolutely powerful, and, and I could tell enough stories to take up the, not only my allotted time, but all of you a lot of times as to how God answered prayer in this race arena. But I'm just going to tell one story. Uh, and it's, of course, my favorite. I would have chosen another one. But I could, this is my favorite story. Um, I was defending a woman named Robin Deagle in Ohio um, a very long time ago now, um, in the, probably in the 1990s. Um, and uh, the way HSLDA was organized in those days, there were three lawyers, Mike Smith, Chris Klicka, and me. And Mike and Chris essentially did almost all of the office practice, dealing with school districts, uh, dealing with truant officers. And, you know, and I did a little bit of that, but not, not a lot, a reduced load there. But I essentially did all the litigation, uh, both the trial litigation and the appellate litigation. Uh, in those days. And so, um, so Chris or Mike would work up a case um, and, and, but, but when it actually got to court, I took over. And so I'd never had actually talked to this lady, Robin Deagle. I, I wrote the uh, trial brief um, ahead of time, sent it to the court and um, was on a plane to Ohio a, a, um, a couple of days before the trial. And I was gonna spend the day before the trial with Robin to get, you know, to get her ready for trial at this, you know, it was a very low level court. And, and so we were gonna spend the day together um, getting her ready for trial. So I got to her house. It was, uh, uh, oh, I need to say one more thing as a preliminary. I had, uh, because of what was in the file, um, I initially had written, uh, the brief I'd written, uh, argued religious freedom and a pretty standard Christian, a set of beliefs about homeschooling uh, from some, some notes that, that Chris had in the file. And so I, the, the brief had been written that way. Um, but as I was reading over the file in more, in more detail on the plane, I began to have real doubts about this lady's religious beliefs. I didn't, you know, I, I thought I may have over, overstated her beliefs. Um, and so that was on my list of things to cover with her. So the, the uh, I got to her house. It was a beautiful June day in Ohio, just a gorgeous day. And we sat at her picnic table in her backyard and and did this several hours of preparation. And the uh, um, went through a lot of material, went through her educational material, and uh, it came to a point where I had to talk to her about her religious beliefs um, in order to. Um, set the stage for the religious freedom claims that we were, we were making. And it became really apparent that she believed in God, but that was about it. She did, you know, she had a high respect for the Bible. And, and so I shared the gospel with her uh, and she prayed to receive Christ right then and there. 
And I was really ecstatic. I thought this was, you know, this is so wonderful. And I told her that I thought God was going to do something special in her case to welcome her to the family of God. You know, I'm, I'm Baptist by background, and we're not given to things like gifts of prophecy and stuff. That's, you know, it, it's just, you know, it's on, in that Baptist hymnal that we're not allowed to do things like that. And, and so uh, um, I, uh, you know, Kristen Wagner, our general counsel of the ADF, she's in the Assemblies of God. That's more, you know, kind of that, that uh, realm. But uh, anyhow, that's what I said. And um, I told her to start reading the Bible. And I got to the court the next day with her. And, and uh, judge called the lawyers into chambers. And uh, he said, Mr. Ferris, I've read your brief. It's a pretty good brief. Uh, but you're going to lose today. Um, now, I've been in a lot of courts where I thought the judge made up his mind before we ever started, but they're not supposed to say so. Uh, they're, you know, they're supposed to actually listen to the evidence. And, and so, uh, um, I, you know, the, the Bible verse that immediately came to my mind at that point was from Deuteronomy, where it says, if the prophet says, thus saith the Lord, and it doesn't come to pass, you're supposed to take up stones and, and kill the false prophet. And uh, I, I had just hoped that Robin didn't start reading in Deuteronomy, but stayed in the book of John, like I suggested to her. And so um, we started the trial. I, I didn't, I couldn't tell her. I just, I didn't have the courage to tell her. All I said was, um, this is going to be a tough case. That's, that's what I said. And uh, so I, um, the superintendent was put on the stand and um, came time for me to cross-examine. And a, a question jumped into my head that I had not prepared for. I never ask it in any other case ever, um, uh, before or after. And I, I but I asked, it just jumped in my head and I asked it. I said, uh, Mr. Superintendent, did you uh, uh, get any legal advice before you denied this family the right to homeschool? He said, well, I didn't talk to any lawyers or anything like that, but I talked to some government officials. I said, well, like who? He said, well, like the judge here for one. I said, you talked to this judge about this case before he's ever filed in the court? And he said, yeah. Uh, well, we won that day. and. Uh, what happened is the judge took his, the lawyers back in chamber and yelled at the prosecutor and said, you go tell that superintendent to approve this family's homeschooling right now. And that was the end of the case. And so um, I've seen God powerfully work in this area. So don't forget to pray. Um, and with that, Mike, I am ready to uh, uh, interact with my panelists uh, or take questions from the audience, uh, whatever is appropriate. Well, thank you uh, very much, Mike. I appreciate uh, your remarks here. You know, I, I want to ask a couple questions, and uh, I don't see any questions in the Q and A. People have probably been just listening uh, very intently to your comments. Um, but uh, Mike, as you as you talked, um, you know, the story of homeschooling is the story of individual families like Robin Deagle, and yeah. and so I really appreciated you know you you really personalizing that because. You know, that's what homeschooling is about. It's about parents making this decision, homeschooling their kids, and, and, and it's an intensely personal thing. And, you know, we're at the movement level in some respects, but at the end of the day, we can't forget this is individual families. And, and you know, at HSLDA, we deal with individual families every single day. And that's what homeschool organizations need to do. They need to not forget that, you know, there's this, there's a movement level, but there's also the individual family level. And, and these things interact, just like you said, there's a, there's a relationship between legislation and litigation. Um, but I want to ask you about, about this thing, and then hopefully we'll get some other questions from the, from the panel and the audience. Um, you know, you talked about homeschoolers working together uh, and, you know, standing together. And um, I've often talked about trying to get homeschoolers to work together as like, you know, herding cats. Uh, homeschoolers are fiercely independent minded. It's tough sometimes to, to, to bridge the gaps and, and, and work those things together. And in, in the homeschool community in the U.S., we've had some issues with that respect. Could you comment a little bit on that? You kind of talked about that a little bit in encouraging Christian, secular, everybody, regardless of belief, to work together. Do you, do you have any other words of wisdom that you could share about, about that? Well, uh, the first thought that comes to mind is the most successful experience that I remember uh, of homes, homeschoolers of all stripes coming together was in California uh, when the Jonathan L case, <coughs> excuse me, I'm battling a little bit of a cold. <coughs> the Jonathan L case was um, before the courts. And uh, just for those of you who don't know the background, um, California um, had a very old court decision 
that would have, was interpreted by officials to ban homeschooling. Um, but there was a statutory path that seemed to allow it if you, you know, filed an affidavit and basically created a, a private school at your own home is what it amounted to. Uh, and there were a whole lot of homeschoolers in California doing that. And this family uh, that was not members of HSLDA uh, got in trouble with the authorities and they had a public defender uh, defending their case in, in the lower courts. And then it was in a juvenile proceeding, so it was secret. Nobody, nobody knew about it uh, at all. No, no one in the homeschooling movement had any idea. Um, and the trial judge ruled in their favor and they appealed, the, the, the government appealed to the Court of Appeals. And this is still all secret until the, the, the appellate court issued an opinion that homeschooling was illegal in California. And then the, uh, you know, everybody knew and, and, and it, was, it was chaos. Uh, and so uh, we worked with everybody, everybody imaginable, um, homeschoolers of all stripes, um, ADF got involved, uh, you know, a lot of groups left and right got involved in that case. And, the, uh, and, and uh, uh, Jim Mason and I, um, Jim is the VP of litigation at HSLDA today, but he was, he was my chief deputy at the time. We ghost wrote for the public defenders, the motion for reconsideration uh, for, for the court and, and then filed our own amicus briefs um, in the case. And the, the, the court ended up allotting time and, and in a way that's consistent with European practice, but, but quite unusual for American practice, the court allowed um, the uh, amici to present oral arguments. And normally a, a state court of appeals case is scheduled for 15 minutes aside of oral argument, sometimes 10 minutes aside of oral argument. But in this case, they, they scheduled two hours for oral argument and just you know unprecedented. And, and so I was given the task of arguing the constitutional issues uh, that day. And there were statutory issues or constitutional issues and there were some factual issues, but I argued the constitutional issues. They had about probably 40 minutes of the time uh, for, our, for our side, um, something like that. It was, I had a, a good chunk of time. But it was the coalition that stood together because we had to. I mean, all of our freedoms were at stake. And, and, and so because of that, that decision. And so what people need to realize is every day all of our freedoms are at stake. It's not just when there's a bad decision on the, on the table. You know, this, this, this situation in, in England, this decision, it's not a horrible decision, but it's a troubling decision. Um, and, you know, it, it, it seems to open up the door for essentially unbridled discretion of local school officials. And that's not a good thing. Um, the, you know, um, subjectivity and public schools and homeschooling is not a good combination. And so, um, so it's, it's, not, it's not the end of the world. It's not as bad as the Jonathan L decision, but it's not a good thing. And, and so uh, homeschoolers of all stripes need to stand together and fight those things. And so it's, it's, the, the key is recognizing all of our rights are on the line every single day. And we need to be constantly aware of that. And when, when you're in a battle together, it tends to uh, bring people together in a positive way. Thank you, Mike. We have a question here from, that's a great, uh, that's very helpful and encouraging. I appreciate that. Um, and Lizzie will talk about that case a little bit here shortly. We have a question from Romania um, and, you know, focusing in on the, the litigation aspect of this question with respect to helping uh, international movements gain legal recognition. Um, could you speak to this idea of using litigation to advance a policy goal, um, which, which kind of feeds a little bit into the UK case, but that's not at a national court. But when, a, when homeschooling is not recognized in law, um, what's the best way to go about doing that? Is, and, and court may or may not be the best way. Sometimes you don't have a choice because if you got a family, you got to defend them all the way. But there's you know, points where you can get on and off the litigation path. And this is a complicated question, but you know, how would you think about using litigation to advance policy ob objective to advance homeschooling freedom? 
a Romanian pastor was just here in my office yesterday. And my daughter runs a Romanian uh, orphanage ministry. Um, and I've been to Romania a few times. But I, even with all that, I don't feel qualified to say that if the American experience is, is identical to the Romanian experience. But I, I think there are some overlaps. And so I'll, I'll just tell you how it worked in, in my experience. Um, <clears throat> I think the litigation was absolutely essential to legislative success. Uh, that uh, I, I, I likened this in the military um, analogy to the, the, the lawyering was the Air Force, but the legislation was the Army. Uh, and, and that, uh, and, and, this, and the local state groups of homeschoolers were effectively the army that was going to bring about the, the legislative success. And so the lawyers played a key role in getting the enemy, you know, in, in the military analogy, willing to talk to us, you know, they, they, hopefully they're not enemies, but there's people that need to be convinced, the, you know, the government officials. Um, but it, it tend to loosen them up and tend to open the door for things. Uh, and um, the, it certainly was, you know, the, the last few states that um, recognized the legality of homeschooling, North Dakota, Michigan, Iowa, were among the last states to recognize the United States. It's absolutely clear that the litigation, that the constant litigation we were engaged in in those states was essential. Now, we won a major case in the Supreme Court of Michigan, and that turned things around, and then the legislation followed. Um, we never did win a major case in North Dakota, but just the constant barrage of it eventually got the, the, the legislators of that state willing to, to change the law and to uh, recognize the right to homeschooling. I, I never want to say that they created the right to homeschool. God creates that right. Um, the, uh, and, and that um, prior right existence is confirmed by the, the, the UDHR and, and the the two implementing treaties of the UDHR, the ICCPR and the ICESCR uh, that you mentioned earlier, Mike. <clears throat> and in, in, I, I, this is a side international law note. The, um, the provisions of the ICESCR are notable in that the non-derogability provisions of, of, of that treaty say that you generally can't derogate the rights that are protected in the treaty with certain exceptions, but there's a list of, I think it's seven things, seven articles that you can't derogate no matter what, not even if the existence of the state is at, is at hand, you know, that, that you're, you know, your nation's going to go out of existence. You still can't do slavery. You can't, still can't do deliberate race discrimination, and you still can't deny the right of parents to um, choose a form of education consistent with their own moral values. That's in that list of non-derogability, which is why I think that the European Court of Human Rights has got it so wrong about the German cases, is because they are not, this is not in the margin of appreciation. There's no such thing as a margin of appreciation for non-derogable rights. It just, they're just fundamentally wrong about that. And so, um, and you know, the, the, the wording of the ICESCR would allow uh, reasonable inquiries that the, the, the children are making academic progress, but choosing the form of education is off the table. Uh, the, the, you know, that's, the, I, I think, the proper reading of the, of the provisions. And I believe the ECH, the European uh, Covenant on Human Rights, should be read in the same, same manner. So um, anyhow, that's a, a side note uh, for what it's worth. Well, Mike, I just uh, want to thank you very much. I can tell that uh, you, uh, you're battling that cold valiantly, and I know you have to uh, move on. Uh, so I think we'll, we'll go ahead and end your remark here, unless you have some, just a few final comments. I'm just glad to be here. I wish you all the best. I see many friends on the screen, and uh, I look forward to seeing you all in person someday soon. Well, thank you, Mike. We are going to be having another conference uh, coming up soon, and we'll be announcing that shortly, and I hope you'll be able to attend that one. We've appreciated your participation with the others. Thanks so much, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Have a great day. Uh, so thank you. Again, that was great, Mike Ferris. Um, I am going to change the order up just a little bit. We do have some scheduling issues we're dealing with, with some of our speakers. So 
I am going to ask our Brazilian uh, friend, Alexandre uh, Moreira, who is a good friend of mine. Uh, I'm gonna introduce him briefly because his time is short with us, unfortunately, and Lorcan then uh, we're gonna turn to you. It was a great segue Mike gave us there about the ECHR, but we just have to make a, a slight change here to accommodate our speakers' uh, schedules. Uh, so uh, Alexandre Moreira is a, is a dear friend of mine. I've known Alexandre for at least 12, 13 years, and we have worked in the trenches together. Um, he's been the general counsel for the, um, the National Association of Homeschoolers in Brazil for a number of years. He's written books on homeschooling. Uh, he was my co-author and the principal drafter of the Rio Principles, uh, which is an extremely important document. I really want to encourage anyone who's interested in the interaction of human rights and homeschooling to read the Rio Principles. Um, and uh, I, I also um, want to mention that he's been a um, he was a national secretary in Brazil for um, human rights and uh, has been involved in government capacities uh, at the Ministry of Finance uh, in Brazil, as well as the Ministry of Education. So Alexandre, please share with us your experience um, about litigating. And you were involved in the biggest case in Brazil um, about homeschooling. So please share with us uh, your insight and your wisdom uh, before you have to go. Uh, first of all, how how it all started? Well, usually someone gets involved in homeschooling because he wants to homeschool but have some legal issues and then would start an organization and do something about it. Let's say it was from the day-to-day -day practice to the political and judicial activism. Uh, but for me, curiously, it was the other way around. Well, I wrote uh, several books. I'm a professor, a scholar here in Brazil, and a lot of articles on jurisprudence. And uh, once something caught my attention, I read a uh, newspaper about a family who are being prosecuted in, in a small city in the country because they were homeschooling. It was 2008. I didn't know them what was homeschooling. And uh, I just felt I have to do something about it. So I decided to write in defense of this family and uh, it was published in some uh, legal publications, but my surprise is that people start coming after me asking, please, please help us, help us, we are having problems. And I said, but uh, I'm not uh, specialized in uh, law and education, and I'm not a homeschooler, I just wrote an article. And they said, it is the only article, legal article about homeschooling in Brazil. It's only you, please do something. So it was the way it started. And in 2010, we started the National Homeschool Association here in Brazil. 2016 was a very special year for us because of the Global Homeschool Conference in Rio de Janeiro in which we declared the real principles. And another landmark was 2018 in the judgment of the homeschool case on the Brazilian Supreme Court, in which we acted as amicus curiae. Uh, we did a legal brief about the case we defend in front of the judge. And uh, in the end, we got, uh, uh, how can I say to you gently, not a very good decision. We knew that uh, the struggle will have to go on because it was very badly written to be very sincere for you. Uh, for example, they said that homeschooling in Brazil was not unconstitutional. Why did they say, didn't they say in the, the affirmative that homeschool is constitutional in Brazil? Okay, it's very confused, 
we have to deal with it, a final decision. And we start requiring much more in the states, in the municipalities, uh, in the national legislature that will have a specific bill for homeschooling. And uh, it, in the last years since 2018, things got much faster. It was like uh, the re realization of uh, long years of work. We'll have, we have right now a bill proposal in our national Congress, probably about to be voted. And uh, right now we have uh, two states in Brazil that approved the bill on homeschooling and uh, the federal district that it's like DC in the United States and practice three states and much more to go on. And uh, we are already foreseeing the next steps in, in our fi fight uh, with the approved legislations. It will, will be the fight for the pedagogical curricular freedom from the homeschooled families. Well, what would be the top three lessons that we learned this 13 years. First of all, before the judge, we cannot speak only about uh, generalities, about uh, the constitutionality of homeschooling, the legality, the international traits. This is important, but every case is unique. That means you have to explain to the judge why this family must have the right to homeschool. The best case we have here in Brazil were very peculiar, very singular, because the lawyers were able to stress the particularities of the case. Second, we dealt long, long years in a situation with no law at all here in the country. That means that we had to be very creative. And I know that the Brazilian situation is not unique. In dozens of countries around the world, there is no legislation at all for homeschooling. That means if you don't have a specific law for homeschooling, you have to use principles, you have to use analogy, the international treaties of human rights, you must create. And uh, that's why we made uh, an effort to create a scholarship specific for homeschooling here in Brazil. And uh, the third uh, lesson, the ideal target is not to get the, uh, to win in the court. The ideal target for the lawyers is to avoid getting into court. A lot of cases, uh, frankly, most of them can be resolved before getting into court, maybe with the local authorities, maybe with an, an agreement with the prosecutor. Getting into court is in practice half a loss for us. It, was, it is very demanding, very, risky. Let's work before that. And uh, what I would wish to know, let's say 10 years ago, well, I'll tell you something. When everything started in our association, the president of our association, Rick Dias, told me, oh, we already have a bill proposal in our national Congress in six months, it will be all over. And I said to him, uh, most probably 10 years. No, no, sorry, most probably five years. And uh, he told me last week, Alexandre, you, I said six months, you said five years, and we are getting it after 10 years. What I learned, the struggle never ends. And it never ends because it's not only about homeschooling. 
we are on the midst of a cultural war, a, cult, a war against our most shared values. And the other side will never stop. We see in the American experience that only have a law for homeschooling is not enough. We have to keep defending the freedoms and the rights of the family, even in the most, uh, the best situations ever. We have to keep defending it until the end, probably the, until the end of our lives. And uh, talking as a Christian, well, our final target is the eternal life. So we can't just think on short terms. We must think always in long-term goals that will be accomplished over time. So I learned to be patient and to have resilience. Finally, talking about some practical tips for a homeschool organization leader. Well, first of all, you don't have everything done in your head. That means you are not omniscient and you have to always listen to the families. In fact, you are not promoting your own opinion. You're promoting the opinion of the families. You can't act isolated. Second, every cause is worth in fighting for. What I mean by that? We know that some causes are losted, that will not win that case, but is still worth fighting for. Why? Because as Mike Smith said, we are building the critical mass. And it comes to the third point. There is only one strategy. There are not... Uh, strategies for the court and strategies for the uh, legislative. In fact, they are all the same thing and all are mutually influenced. So you must think in political terms and legal terms simultaneously. In fact, and in my speech, we are trying to change a culture. And uh, my personal aim in Brazil is for the authorities here to see uh, homeschool and educational freedom in general and as something uh, banal, as something uh, common, mainstream, that uh, you don't even have to argue about it. You can disagree personally, but uh, you say, okay, it's uh, only a personal option of each one. And uh, we are on this direction in Brazil. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Alexandre. I know you have to, uh, you have to go, so we won't d detain you with questions, but I want to, uh, I just want to observe, I think that, you know, your comments here are very helpful. Um, just recapping um, and, and, and also, synergistic with what Mike Ferris was saying. Um, it's a long battle. Um, we have to focus on the families. Uh, we have to be creative um, and avoiding court if possible, but you know, always fighting for every family. Uh, those are not mutually exclusive. And uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I so appreciate you and um, the work that you have been doing in Brazil. Uh, you are a real global leader in this in this fight, uh, and it is a cultural battle. I think that's a very important point that we have to remember as lawyers, and even when we're thinking about how to litigate, when to litigate, all the in the details, you know, every case is about an individual family, but every case is just a piece of the puzzle. It's a piece of a puzzle that we're building, and that, build, that puzzle, uh, when it's finished, is a picture of a society where mm -hmm. educational freedom is recognized, as you said, as a common good, uh, as something that's mainstream, normal, and good. And, and when you look at the world, I think you see the pieces of the puzzle 
uh, you know, we're trying to put these pieces together on a global basis. We're fighting, it's, there are fights in many different realms, political, uh, cultural, uh, and, and, uh, and legal. So thank you for those remarks. Any final words before uh, we say goodbye to you? No, just thank you, my friend, for the opportunity to, to be with you again. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandre. Appreciate that very much. All right. Well, let's turn to uh, let's turn to Lorcan Price. Um, Lorcan, as you get your uh, your slides ready to to share, there allow me to introduce uh, introduce you. If I can find my the correct like I don't need I don't need it. I know you well enough. <laughs> Just tell them whatever you think. Uh, well, <laughs> you no, know, I can't do that, Lat. If I did that, they wouldn't want to listen to you. That's maybe, maybe that's right. Just stick with the scripture. No, that's remarks. not true at all. It's not true at all. I, Lorcan is my dear friend, uh, uh, and uh, I've, I've so appreciated uh, getting to know you, Lorcan, over the years as, we've, as we have fought the battles for freedom uh, in the European Court of Human Rights. You are, the, you are ADF's European Legal Counsel with the responsibility for shepherding cases through the European Court of Human Rights. Not a small task, not an easy task harder than herding cats for sure. Um, and uh, you're an Irish barrister. Uh, you didn't give me much more than that. So I'll ask you to uh, just maybe give us a little bit more, fill us in a little bit more about your bona fides in terms of uh, previous uh, legal practice, if you care to, if you're allowed to. Uh, but sure. please with us, Lorcan, uh, thank you for being with us. We're so delighted to have you with us to share your experience and wisdom on this very important topic. Please share. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. And uh, good afternoon or good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen depending on where you are. Um, it's a real pleasure to speak to you today uh, in relation to the, the general issue of uh, homeschooling, but with a slight bias on my part to the international courts and international law. Um, as Mike said, I am an Irishman. I'm a barrister uh, by profession, but I work for ADF International. I'm their legal counsel here in Strasbourg, uh, which is where I'm joining you from. And this is also the seat of the European Court of Human Rights which for those of us in Europe uh, is obviously a very important venue for determining the extent and the scope and the application of the European Convention on Human Rights. And very often we see uh, our national litigation on a range of issues uh, end up here in Strasbourg uh, for a final determination. Um, and that is true of homeschooling. Uh, ADF works in a wide range of areas, uh, essentially based around our Christian understanding of human dignity, um, the right to life would be primarily among those, the right to uh, religious freedom, uh, and then the rights of the family uh, founded on marriage. And that's a lot of my work revolves around those principal areas. But as, as, as Mike said, uh, and as indeed as all the speakers have said, the right to educate one's children in accordance with your beliefs is a core element of the rights of the family as they are protected in international law. So drawing in from the, the, the large UN treaties um, uh, and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights into the European Convention, I want to give you a little idea of, of where we found ourselves in relation to that. And then to come down to a national level jurisdiction, my own, uh, the Republic of Ireland, to give you a sense of how uh, we've seen some litigation successfully uh, move to the, the higher courts there. So now I'll try and share my screen with you. So uh, I beg your indulgence, Hopefully smoke doesn't start coming out of my laptop um, because I have a presentation. Oh, here we go. Right. So this should work. So fingers crossed. Okay. So um, yes, uh, the first uh, picture, uh, terrifyingly enough, is a picture of the European Court of Human Rights. So this uh, ugly building is the venue of uh, a lot of the dramas um, in, in the areas that I work with. Um, and really what, what I'm looking at here is, is the convention. And um, crucially, uh, just to mop up any confusion, it's not uh, the European Court of Justice and it's not the International uh, Court of, of Justice in, in The Hague. So we, we deal primarily with the convention, obviously. And uh, the crucial thing to, to remember for those of us who are talking from a European perspective is that there is a direct right of application from every individual who is uh, on the territory of a member state. So you don't necessarily have to be a citizen or even domiciled or habitually resident. So that makes it a very important court. Um, how important it is depends on where you are, uh, really. Um, and so uh, this is just a quick look at a 10-year 
period between 2010 and 2021 of compliance with decisions from the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, so the, the lighter the colour, the more compliant the country is. The darker the colour, the less compliant. So uh, it's pretty clear there, Russia does not really pay very much attention to the decisions of the European Court of Human Rights, whereas in Western Europe, it is important. Now, for our, for our perspective, um, this is problematic because the European Court of Human Rights has not been helpful uh, on the issue of homeschooling, and that's putting it mildly. But let's look at where the court derives, let's say, the principal uh, statement in, 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 in the convention scheme for uh, the rights of parents, and that's under Article 2 of Protocol 1. Uh, uh, virtually every country in, in the convention has signed up to uh, the optional protocols. This is Protocol Number 1, which came in very early after the full convention was signed in 1950. The Protocol 1 was, it was brought in in the mid-1950s. And very clearly there, uh, it protects the right, we would say, of parents to, uh, or it articulates the right and protects it in law of parents to protect or to, to direct the education of their children in conformity with their own religious and philosophical uh, convictions. And we have really stressed this right in any litigation that we've found ourselves taking at the level of the, the court in Strasbourg. And I think, and I think Mike would agree with me, that that is a very strong statement there in Article 2 of uh, the right to parental control of education. Sadly, though, uh, and, and we all know this, there's often a disconnect between what the law says and what courts will interpret the law and meaning in practice. So um, just to give you two principal examples that are cited by the case in, or by the court in all decisions in relation to homeschooling, they're relatively recent. They're, they're certainly from this, uh, from the last two decades, and they're both involved Germany and uh, Conrad in Germany and Dogen and others in Germany are the two that I've cited there. And uh, they are very weak jurisprudence on education. Essentially, uh, and they directly relate to uh, homeschooling as opposed to other questions such as um, uh, sex education and so on, um, that uh, the country uh, that is Germany has a, a right, as it were, or has certainly the, the uh, margin of appreciation uh, as the court calls it, to be able to restrict uh, education in provided in the home on the basis that uh, education, as the court sees it, is a collective activity, that it's not simply about imparting information, but it's about forming citizenship. And the court was very keen to stress that Germany has a legitimate interest, that is, that the state and the authorities, in restricting the emergence of parallel societies. So that's a very uh, troubling, I think, um, set of decisions, principally around Germany, that have come from the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, and I think it's it's fair to say that in, in terms of how these cases have developed, um, the court has cited those two admissibility decisions in every subsequent case that we've taken to the court. And so uh, I think really when we look at taking the case as far as the European Court of uh, Human Rights, um, and this can be true, sadly, of, of international courts generally. Once they have taken a damaging position like this, it can take decades, really, for them to overturn or move their jurisprudence. And um, I don't see any immediate evidence that they're going to change their position in Strasbourg. In, in practice, then, this means that there are real victims uh, associated with this kind of approach. And this family is the Wunderlich family, a uh, lovely German family, who uh, were residing in, in the state of uh, Baden-Württemberg across the Rhine from me here. And uh, they have been the subject, or the victims rather, of some pretty uh, extraordinary levels of uh, oppression and persecution by the German educational authorities for their decision to homeschool uh, their, their four children. Um, and you can see them there. Uh, we, uh, together with Mike, have been involved in, in, in HSLDA in this case for quite a number of years. And it eventually made its way through the German domestic courts um, where uh, the family, as I say, were in and out of court. Uh, on one occasion, the German police surrounded their house for a dawn raid uh, and uh, took the children into immediate care with over 50 policemen and officials present. So the kind of overreaction that the German authorities had to this family homeschooling is indicative of the approach 
Germany takes uh, to try and force parents to send their children to schools that are recognized by the state. Uh, this case did, as I say, went to the European Court of Human Rights. The court communicated the case. In other words, it accepted it. Alas, uh, the court applied its previous set of decisions uh, involving Germany um, and decided that the case was inadmissible under uh, Article 2, Protocol 1, and also under the claims we made in relation to interference with private and family life under Article 8. So uh, the message was sent out by the European Court of Human Rights that it was okay for the German government to uh, essentially take children into care where there was no evidence whatsoever of any harm. Uh, being, the children weren't subjected to any harm. They were clearly competent in, in relation to any testing that was done uh, academically and the parents uh, were committed to their education, but that still did not sway the court in Strasbourg. Um, and that's really, I think, uh, a major problem when it comes to the international courts, in, in Europe at least, that we have this very difficult and troubling jurisprudence already in place. Um, moving on to some good news, though, uh, this is the Burke family. And over uh, in the middle there, you see uh, young Elijah Burke, uh, who's, uh, who's now in university, but at the beginning of the pandemic um, in, in 2020, uh, the Irish government decided that, uh, pair, that, that children would not sit state exams uh, at the conclusion of their second level education, but that their grades would be assessed by their teachers. And this posed a problem for homeschooling families because the Irish Department of Education decided that uh, parents who were homeschooling could not assess the grades of the children impartially for the purposes of a university application. And so therefore, uh, they weren't prepared to recognize homeschoolers' right to matriculate to university. Now, uh, young Mr. Burke here and his family took a case uh, after a long process of trying to convince the Irish authorities to make some other mechanism available for homeschoolers so that they would have uh, you know, their, their grades assessed maybe by way of a correspondence exam or some other form of assessment, the Irish Department of Education refused completely and simply uh, put no uh, form of, of, of assistance or redress in place for them. They appealed that decision or they took a judicial review to the High Court in, in, in Dublin. They won that case. Uh, then I think in a decision that uh, one can only kind of be completely baffled at, the Irish Minister for Education appealed her loss to the Court of Appeal and at the Court of Appeal, um, three judges ruled that not only uh, was the Department of Education and the Minister for Education in the wrong for not facilitating the homeschooling family, but they went far further and they decided that homeschooling had an enormously central part to play in the expression of parental rights within the Irish Constitution. And it was, it was remarkable to see three judges who, uh, all three of them, really, I think it would be fair to describe them as liberals, giving a decision that was rooted in natural law theory about the importance of the family unit and the fact that children's rights can only be recognized within the family unit. And so the decision obviously was to do with homeschooling, but has had, I think, much wider application in terms of strengthening parental rights generally in the Republic of Ireland. So that's a, the reason I show you that case is to counterpoint it with uh, sometimes we, we find that international courts do not give us the decisions we want, but then domestic courts can give very good decisions. And in that case, a lot of international law sources were used by the family in their domestic challenge. So they took the law, such as, 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 as given mentioned earlier by Mike Ferris and Mike Donnelly, that exists at the United Nations level, and that also exists at the level of the European Convention on Human Rights. They applied it directly in their domestic proceedings, and they got a very good outcome, an outcome that they would not have gotten if they had to appeal to the European Court of Human Rights. So what are the takeaway points then in terms of taking uh, cases internationally? And, and this building that I have in the background of the slide is the uh, European Court of Justice. Uh, which is a European Union court, I think it will become a more important court on this issue in the future as well, considering uh, the uh, Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. But international law is good, but the courts are weak, is the first point I would make. So insofar as you can, use international law arguments in your domestic cases. 
the points to, that you can draw out from the UDHR, from the ICCPR, and on from the Covenant on Economics and Social Rights are strong, as are the points that can be made uh, and argued from the European Convention on Human Rights, um, and deploy those effectively domestically. Uh, because I think they're much stronger, uh, or they're probably much more useful at the domestic level than they are at the international level. The next point is, is uh, really, I think, would say the more unreasonable the government's actions, the better the case. And in the case of Burke and the Minister for Justice, we had uh, very unreasonable actions by the government uh, in applying what was really a totally ridiculous uh, approach to that family and refusing to offer them any kind of uh, uh, mechanism or workaround to have their grades assessed for the purposes of applying to university. Um, I think Lizzie will be talking about the actions of the government in the UK case that happened recently. And in that case, you could counterpoint quite strongly, I think, that the judge took the view that the local authority there was behaving reasonably within its statutory powers. So where the government is overreaching very strongly, uh, those are the cases very much to take, and they set very good precedents. And um, I, as I say, use comparative international law. That's not just international law from treaties and uh, covenants, but also case law from countries where homeschooling is, is strong. The United States, a good example, the Republic of Ireland, obviously, I mentioned case there recently, um, and uh, where we can find other decisions then uh, from your own jurisdictions or from neighboring jurisdictions, use those effectively, deploy them effectively as well. And that's why I think um, uh, the, the work that HSLDA and this global homeschooling exchange uh, uh, forum is doing is so important because they have, um, and I'm going to stop sharing at this point, they have at their fingertips really uh, some brilliant resources internationally uh, that can be used even where you don't have a domestic lawyer that has a lot of experience in this area. And I see a number of the questions that have been raised so far in, in the Q&A box make that very point, which is that it's not a speciality that you will find usually, particularly in smaller jurisdictions where there's no history of homeschooling. And the point I would make there is, if you have a competent lawyer, we can provide resources uh, that go right across the world from the United States to European jurisdictions to Asian jurisdictions um, and uh, good examples from international law that will really strengthen uh, the application that you make domestically and show that this is not just a strange and, and, and narrow form of, of education, that it's quite common around the world and that it's growing. So uh, I hope, hopefully you found that uh, very quick tour around some of those issues uh, helpful. And uh, I think Mike will be sharing everyone's email address at the end of this. So. We're, I'm very happy if, if there are any questions arising to pick up, or even now, if, if, if you wish to pose them. So, Mike, I'll hand back over to you. Lorcan, thank you. Excellent, as I expected. Really appreciate that. Um, I do have a question for you, but we'll save it if we can till the end. I want to give everyone a chance to get their remarks in, and if we have sure. time at the end, we will continue with some questions. Um, that, was, that was great. Um, excellent. So, okay, Lizzie, you're next. Um, so Lizzie Trofton is a legal officer for ADF International based in London in the UK. Uh, before joining ADF International, she was an international consultant advising uh, global institutions on regulatory and compliance matters and worked uh, also in legal capacity at the UK Ministry of Justice and the World Health Organization. Uh, she has a law degree and an LLM in international law and human rights from Warwick University and a master's in socio-legal studies from the University of Nottingham. Uh, Lizzie, I'm very eager to hear what you have to say. Please, Lizzie, share with us your experience and your remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. It's good to join you today. I also have a presentation, so I'll just try and share my screen. As Mike said, I'm based in the UK. Um, our office is in London, and so we work in Westminster, and um, we're a small team here uh, in the UK with ADF UK. Uh, we work with parliamentarians mostly, and we provide legal advice, and we work on policy. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about a very UK-centric um, idea about home education. We call it elective home education here instead of homeschooling. 
And you may be aware that in the UK, we have four nations. England is one of them, and uh, the education law is different across all the nations. So I'm going to be focusing specifically on England. We have worked with Welsh law as well, um, but uh, today I'll just be looking at England. So just as a bit of general background before I go into the case uh, where a judgment was delivered this week, um, which will be of interest to everyone. Um, the law here in England is a little bit complex on the education side. Um, we have legislation itself. Um, the, the statutory basis for home education says that parents can home educate as a viable option um, instead of uh, sending a child to school. And um, they must do so in accordance with um, an education that is suitable. And that has to be suitable to a child's age, um, ability, aptitude, and any special educational needs. Um, we've also got the Children Act and um, pupil registration regulations. And there are a few other uh, smaller pieces of law that govern how home education is regulated in the UK that provides both the uh, duties for parents, as I've said, but also duties for the local authority. Now, um, the way that our, our system is set up here is that we have national law, and then we also have delegated law or delegated authority to local authorities. So they're the specific parts or the, the counties as you were around England. And um, uh, the local authority can have a lot of responsibility in looking after children and looking after safeguarding needs of children. Um, so I've referenced here section, um, a section SAO, um, that refers to a school attendance order. So that means that if a local authority is aware that a child is not receiving suitable education that the parent must provide, they can say, parent, you must send your child to school. They also have other duties to respond if they are aware of safeguarding issues. So, for example, if the child is at harm within the home. Then we move on to the slightly more complex area, and that is regulation and guidance. So, as you can see here at the very top, we have statutory guidance. Uh, the Department for Education has written out um, what uh, local authorities must do related to home education and related to children not in school. Um, the statutory guidance is from 2016, um, and it's primarily about safeguarding, but it um, links home education to safeguarding um, in that. And then we've also got non-statutory guidance. Now, this was again written by the Department for Education. Um, it is not as binding, but it still kind of gives a landscape for what local authorities and parents must do or ought to do rather um, in home education. And then to the right, we have case law. Um, case law is relatively thin here in England um, regarding home education. Um, very few cases that we can actually mention. Um, uh, so the first one on the list is the Joy Baker case. And you might have heard of Joy Baker. She's really held up in the home education community as a hero. Um, back in the 1950s, she started about a 10 year court process where she said, Education otherwise in the law, i.e. the law at the time, the 1944 Act, said that children could be in school or otherwise. She said that that should mean home education. And um, she had a long legal battle on her hand and um, eventually she won the case. And she's really heralded as somebody who fought for the right for children to be home educated. After that, we have a couple more cases and and um, in these cases, there were very specific areas of law that were being looked at. Um, and I'll just draw your attention to the fact that the last of those cases is in 1985. Um, after that, there hasn't been much interaction with the courts and home education, but we have had new pieces of law and we've had statutory and non-statutory guidance. So up until this year, I'd say that um, most of our law regarding home education in England relied upon the text of statute, which is quite minimal. Um, it basically says that education needs to be suitable. And if not, um, then the local authority can step in or it's been laid out in statutory or non-statutory guidance, which kind of gives um, authorities powers to intervene. 
The other thing I'd say is that there's a gray box down here. Now this is looking to the future. So um, there have been recommendations over around the last 10 years or so that there is more regulation um, in home education so that families are taken um, a closer look at by local authorities um, or by the state. And um, this is very pertinent at the moment because there are some current recommendations by, by Parliament to introduce a register for home educated children. Um, previously, uh, parents do not need to let the state know if they're home educating, if they do it from scratch. Um, and also they have recommended in-person assessments. And this is obviously um, going to be very significant for, for all the home educating families in the UK. And um, uh, there's an opportunity now to be able to engage with policymakers um, to try and um, stop the ramifications of, of those recommendations being so bad. But that gives the, the background. And, and I take your attention to this case of Goodred in 2021. Um, and this is what I'm just going to talk about here. So this is the Portsmouth City Council case. Um, I've written out a timeline here and um, this is very significant. The judgment only came out two days ago. So we're still trying to process what it means and the ramifications for the home education community. But suffice to say that it really will be significant in how we understand the role of the local authority and how it can intervene in uh, every family's life um, and can look at the education provided. So the timeline is this, last July in 2020, uh, a family was asked to provide evidence about how they were educating their three children. Now, a lot of home educating families uh, in England and across the UK have taken it upon themselves to, to think of themselves as the, the owner of what this means, um, what is a suitable education. And indeed, it hasn't really been contested much, but Portsmouth City Council and Portsmouth is an area in the south of England um, that were given this authority by the national government to be able to decide really how they handled home education. They asked for samples of work. So the family said, actually, we're not going to provide you samples of our work, but we're going to tell you how we're educating our children, because we think that there's latitude within the guidance to just tell you um, what we're doing and to say that is suitable and our children are progressing well. And the council said, um, that's not good enough. We want to find out more information. The way that the council were able to do this is because in the guidance, it talks about an exchange of information between the council and parents, but it leaves it as a very gray area. So it says that the council can ask questions or can make informal inquiries if they want to find out whether education is suitable. The aim of that is either to ask the child to be put in school if there's really poor education provided or that they could trigger some safeguarding um, uh, arrangements if they feel that the child is at risk. But that wasn't really clarified. So the family said, we don't want to provide any more information and they submitted a complaint about it. And then eventually, um, if we come forward here to 2021 at the very start of this year, the, lo um, the local authority, the Portsmouth City Council said, we're not satisfied that you're providing suitable education and therefore we're going to impose an order on you to send your children to school. The family wanted to contest this and so they sent a letter before action basically saying, we'll take you to court if you don't respond to us. Um, and then here in February, a judicial review claim was issued. Now this means that the family lodged the claim with the court and a judicial review is asking the court to see whether the local authority has been lawful or unlawful um, in what it has done. Um, we fast forward to the 18th of October and the case was heard in the High Court. Um, and that, that's not the, the highest court in the land. There, there are still two other courts above it, but that's the court that generally deals with um, these matters uh, where the, the local authority is, is, is questioned on its um, lawfulness. And then the judgment was handed down two days ago. You can see that it gathered some media attention here in the BBC and on um, national news. And it was really um, spoken about as a David against Goliath moment 
um, the, the small home educators versus the large council. So what happened as a result? Well, the judgment was not favorable to the home education family. The family was arguing that they had more latitude under the guidance to be able to say, we are the final determiners of what is a suitable education. The local authority was saying, actually, we want you to be able to prove that to us. And, and that was where the basis of the argument was. And, and what the judge said was that actually that wasn't unlawful for the local authority to make those inquiries. The family had said, actually, your guidance is unlawful because you, you shouldn't have to ask for us for very specific examples. You shouldn't have to ask us to show progress because in this country, we're free to be able to choose what curriculum we teach our children, we're free to be able to choose how our child progresses to use whatever ped pedagogical methods we want to use. But um, that was contested and the judge fell on the side of the local authority. Importantly, the judge said that there was a large margin of discretion for the local authority. Um, this has really large ramifications. I'm going to stop uh, sharing my screen here and basically talk about the impacts of this case, because um, the judge used um, certain case law to be able to say that there's a large margin of, of discretion. Um, and it chose a very um, extreme example of um, a case to use um, where a public interest test um, was, was stated. Um, so there are some matters here that really need to be clarified. Um, it's unknown whether the case will be um, appealed. It's likely that it won't be appealed. Um, the reason is because there's no specific area of law that can be challenged. The judge was in essence looking at a gray area of guidance. And it was saying that in this gray area where the local authority has some duties and the family has some duties, we're gonna fall on the side of the local authority. We think that that was reasonable. Um, and so there are certain issues that arise questions that need to be dealt with later and um, it is our job now to figure out whether that should be contested in in um, a court of law whether that would be helpful or whether like in this case um, it wouldn't be helpful for the home education cause so we're going to be looking at can the state say we would like in-person assessments with children that that's been proposed um, and it's currently unclear it's not in the guidance um, can the state say there has to be a certain level of academic achievement and progress or can the parents say we want to decide what academic progress actually means um, can the state say there is a purpose for education that has to fulfill these certain aims for example a social good um, in our schooling system children now have to learn about british values and, and becoming a citizen and and all of these socialization matters is the same for home education. It, it, these things are unknown and the judge has not answered these questions. And the final thing is how much discretion does a local authority have? Um, how much um, discretion between one local authority and another local authority to intervene into the rights of homes? Um, the judge didn't seem to answer that, but he just gave it a wide, a wide margin. So there's lots of um, issues that fall out from this case, um, lots of unanswered questions. The next stage is to think, how can we strategically engage? Um, how is it best for home educators in the UK to engage with this? Um, where um, a system of law has largely been built on guidance, um, is it right for home educators to go to court to challenge the guidance? Um, or does that expose them to risk? As Lorcan said, um, did this case potentially not have the best facts because the family were not choosing to fully engage with the local authority when perhaps providing samples of work may have satisfied the local authority and then um, may have made them retreat and then the family wouldn't now need to send their children to school. Um, and, and, and also the, the question is, is funding. In this case, um, a lot of home education families um, gave money over and they raised almost £40,000. Um, and to take the case further, they would need a lot more money. So thinking strategically as a group of home educators will be really important as to what is worth pursuing next. Of course, on top of that, I had the grey box at the beginning saying there are proposals to bring in a register and assessments in the home. 
Now, is it best place for us to look at influencing policy and guidance before this comes into law? Um, and that, that's an area for the home education um, community and lawyers to be able to engage with next. So I, I leave a lot of questions um, at the end of today, a, a, a bad judgment. Um, the impacts of that are unknown. The um, Department for Education is yet to produce a statement on how this may impact their guidance. Um, the local authority is yet to produce a statement on, on what they will do as well with other families um, as a result of this. Um, so we await that space, but in, in England, um, we have a fight on our hands over the next uh, few coming, upcoming years. Um, so we'd appreciate your, your thoughts and your prayers on that. Thank you. Thank you, Lizzie. That was very helpful. This is a very timely uh, discussion we're having uh, as, as countries all over the world grapple with this issue of more children homeschooling. Uh, and I, I found the Good Red decision very troubling. Uh, and uh, I think that there, is, there are many more questions uh, to be asked, and you've asked some of them, some very important ones. Um, I hope that uh, the, uh, the, the home educators in the UK will ask those questions, uh, because what we see is we live in a world that is, has become smaller and smaller because of technology and innovation. And what happens in one country has an impact on other countries. Uh, I mean, we see a global pandemic, which is the result of things that happened in China um, and, uh, you know, it affects the world. Um, and so the idea that what happens in the UK doesn't affect other countries is, you know, in the area of education policymaking is, is simply not the case. And so we, you know, we have an interest in helping and making sure that bad policy uh, does not travel further. We don't want bad viruses traveling further and bad education policy is like a virus. We don't want it traveling any further either. So lots of questions relating to the Good Red case and uh, really appreciate the work that you've done to, 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 to grapple it, master it, pr create presentation on it, a legal analysis. Um, I've written uh, some materials that I'll be releasing on, on this issue in the coming days. We're going to do a podcast on this in the next couple of days. Um, we're gonna get out there and talk about this issue uh, you know, hopefully for the benefit of, of the UK home educators, uh, but, but for the benefit of others, because uh, there's lessons to be learned here, and uh, we need to learn those lessons quickly so that we don't repeat any mistakes that might have been made. Okay, so let's turn to Portugal. Let's cross the English Channel. Let's travel, uh, you know, down the Bay of Biscay to the end of the peninsula to our good friends in Portugal, where uh, there has been a real fight going on in Portugal. Um, in courts, in the legislature, in the culture. Um, and uh, and I'm, we want to hear from Jose Romalo, who is an attorney. Uh, he is on the ground. Um, we have had a really a, a nice variety of perspectives here, international courts, legal analysis. Uh, we're going to now talk to a lawyer, Mike Ferris, who you know, just has matched, unmatched uh, experience in, in litigating at all levels. Uh, and, and we're going to the ground level, we're going to the trial level, we're going to where th the where things are, you know, where where families are are fighting for their freedom to homeschool. And Jose Romalo is, is one of the heroes of homeschooling in Portugal. Jose, tell us what's happening in Portugal. Give us some insight and wisdom. What lessons have you learned um, as you fight for the freedom of homeschoolers in, in uh, Portugal? Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Jose. Please uh, share your, your, your thoughts with us. Hello to everyone. It's a pleasure and uh, honor to be with you and share uh, my little experience about homeschooling. Uh, as Mike uh, said, I'm in the ground. Uh, I contact uh, with the families directly, uh, attend the court directly. Uh, uh, and when I heard uh, Mike um, talking, I, uh, I have a, a feeling that it that is that from their, their experience, experience that we are done here. In Portugal, we have uh, we find uh, we found two ways to deal with the the state uh, with the government in two levels. Um, in the first place, the families understood that they must have together, they must have 
uh, associated uh, because they understood that is the uh, way of pressure uh, for the, the the legal uh the people that, that will make the, the laws and the governments and the politicians and uh, mel is an association with the uh, strong weight here uh, in, in portugal uh, means uh, free education movement uh, and they have uh, uh, very good work in investigation and providing uh, to the families some advices, uh, practical advices. And um, from my part, I work with the, um, the legal advices. Uh, but what I want to, to share with you is the, the families understood that in the first place must be associated to make pressure. And in the second place must be um, connected to a way to I don't like the word, but to fight uh, against the, the authority in, in the wrong way. Uh, but we also know, and from my experience, I understood that um, uh, the court here, the, the, the state, uh, is trying to, uh, is starting to underst understand how is, what is homeschooling. And uh, as far as the family open, for the authorities, and I will explain what I mean with this, uh, the better, because uh, in, the first, in the first place, the family have, have the, the, um, the feeling to, to, to close uh, in themselves, and it's not good for, for whom wants to know something more, because here in, in Portugal, we have a um, uh, principle that is uh, almost sacred <laughs> that that is uh, the superior the superior uh, child interest that it means that the judge don't care about the parents don't care about the the government just care about the child as as mike said if the child are, 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 is all right it's good and uh, the family must understand that uh, is the first the first step that he must take is to explain to, to someone else, to, to, to the authorities, to the court, to everyone, that these kids are good and th these kids are happy. And after that, they will look at the family in the, another way. They looked at the family, okay, so how can we help you? How can we help to make these kids okay? To make this, uh, okay, we've choose another way of education, but let's work together. I'm a little optimist now <laughs> because uh, I found many, many authorities and many judges more alerted to, to this phenomenon. Uh, I can say yesterday, uh, uh, I uh, was in the, the road for a, a judgment about a homeschooled family and my car burned out, I stopped in the middle of the highway and step on fire and I call to the court and I'm sorry, I cannot go <laughs> because I'm on the road. And the judge herself called me and said, please, I will wait for you, come. We'll, we'll wait for you. So get, a, get some kind of taxi and come to us because we'll wait. Because she knows that um, the presence of the lawyer, not me, will be another one, but uh, the presence of the lawyer with the family will help and will help to manage the things with the judge, with the, the social security. Uh, this judge understood that she needs everyone there to, and we solved the problem there uh, yesterday. So uh, in Portugal, we have the, the now is the people with, uh, is understanding that uh, as Alexandra uh, told, uh, avoiding the court is it, the best way because um, unless we go to the court better, because uh, it, it, um, I don't know if we are in the other countries, but here in Portugal, when the family is detected, first they send a team from social security to understand how the family is. And uh, because uh, the first uh, danger that, that they see 
for the child is, okay, a lot from school, what is going on? It's some kind of what these parents are doing. And uh, that's why we need to open the family because when these guys arrive, they are concerned about the child. And if the family open the doors and say, you know, we are just make homeschooling, we are uh, uh, not anyone wrong, uh, they start to understand that, okay, so, and, and they change the way to look from the someone to, to will charge to someone who can cooperate. Um, if each case uh, is different, but uh, our, our task is to try to make understand all the authorities that these families are good families. And, and it's fun because they now understand that homeschoolers are most informed, are the most, the parents are most uh, uh, interested in, in their kids, most than the normal parents that leave the kids at 8 a.m. and get at uh, 18. And if the school was in 24 hours, I believe many parents give the children to the school and bye-bye. But they understand that the, the, the homeschoolers are most interested, are families with values, and are families that risk everything for the child. And we are existing for a change of minds in the very little way, but I believe it's a matter of time that the legislator will come to understand, come in to understand what is homeschooling in, in the real uh, way. Uh, they, uh, when, when we show the family, for example, in the court or, or in the social security, uh, these people understand that they are more ability to be parents than the others, <laughs> that they are more, more concerned, they are more interested. Um, and from my, my experience is um, something that give me batteries to go on and and uh, trying to make the, the, bet, the better for these families. Uh, in the court, we, we try to not get the thing in the end. We try to solve immediately, as yesterday. Uh, the judge called me, we arrive, and uh, we don't get in to the court, to the, to the room of, of, the, of the trial. We decide the question before. Um, I think it's the best way to, because we can manage with the judges, we can manage with, the, with social security, we can find a plan for this family. And um, it's the, the and, and, and then we, we avoid the, the, that question of put the, the family uh, on risk on the, uh, on the court. Some cases must go there, but uh, my, my way to see this is to avoid that uh, all cost, because we know where our agreement between the family and the social security and all authorities, there are most uh, many ways to, to then change. And then uh, even the, the, the agreement don't is complete full can be changed in the next week, the next month. There are all these options. And we know whether when a judge says, uh, make a decision, uh, we must fight that decision and with all costs and with all um, uh, damage that could come for the family. I believe it's the, the, the strategy of, for the family to answer the question, how can we homeschoolers uh, do uh, the things in, in, the, in their cases? The best strategy is uh, associated and then uh, try to get open and get time because time will help once once they know how the family works how this family are interested how this family is completely uh, uh, focused on this, their, their child and the best for their child they will give time to the family uh, show and to to come um, in connected with with the, the with the state with the, with the government laws and everything uh, for now, we are assisting not the persecution, 
but um, um, to uh, a way to try to make this go around. Uh, in Portuguese, we say it all the time that, okay, we go around. <laughs> it's not like this way, so we get, it's, it's, uh, it's a culture, we cannot change. <laughs> but uh, we'll try to, to make this as a trade, as a, as a way to work uh, with even the policy camp in the, in the, the trial camp. Uh, that's my experience tells me today. Uh, I think I'm, I'm not, um, I'm not will bother you with more, more questions, but uh, I think I, you understood my, my point of view and I'm available for what you need. Jose, thank you so much. Um, it's so good to hear from uh, a lawyer who's on the ground. Um, you know, many of us lawyers, uh, Lorcan has practiced in, in courts I have and in fact, just just yesterday, I had an experience like you're you're relating to me here in the United States because even though homeschooling has been legal in the United States, recognized by law in all fifty states since 1996 and 20, 10, 20 years before that in other states, we still have to go to court for homeschooling issues. As Alexandre said earlier today, the battle never ends. And families need lawyers like you. Uh, and, and so there are so many levels uh, that we as advocates need to be thinking about as we're, as we're doing this work to create space in our cultures, in our countries, for families to, to do what's best for the children. And it's really a battle, um, when you look at the world, a battle between who gets to decide? Is it the state or is it the parents? That's the fundamental question that we in our countries and cultures have to grapple with. Um, and that's the question in the UK, that's the question in Portugal, it's still the question in the United States, it's the question in Ireland. Um, and it's, it's the question in Germany, we're going to Germany now. Um, and we've had such a range of perspectives, mostly lawyers, but we're gonna now have some non-lawyers talking. But these are non-lawyers who have earned a law degree through the hard knocks of fighting in court for at least a decade as the, as the advocates for homeschooling families in Germany, where, uh, as Lorcan uh, mentioned, uh, the jurisprudence in the European Court of Human Rights is directly because of Germany, because of Germany's insistence to persecute, repress, oppress, and not allow homeschooling legally. People do it in Germany, but they have to hide. They have to endure constant legal pressure and threats of, of the youth welfare authorities taking their children. Uh, German families have moved out of Germany in the thousands so they could homeschool. Uh, they have fled to other countries, uh, virtually being chased by police, by uh, social workers, some have come to the United States where they have applied for political asylum. That's crazy. Why does Germany do this? Well, that's, <laughs> we could teach a course on that probably and I, I don't understand why, but uh, Jonathan Ertz and his wife, Irene, um, are involved in leading the fight to, to try to find a way for parents to be able to educate their children. Um, they are the parents of, is it nine or 10? Nine. Nine lovely children. Turn on your microphone, guys. Nine. Did there we right? go. Not, not yet. Yeah. Nine beautiful children. Uh, Jonathan is a farmer by trade. Uh, Irene is from Canada. Um, and uh, Jonathan is the president of it's two associations um, in Germany. Well, one association, the Edu uh, Freedom for Education Association in Germany. Uh, fight, leading the fight for freedom of education in Germany, and also um, another association that is fighting for a particular methodology that they hope maybe the German state will recognize, and they've been fighting in court for years and years. So Irene, please share with us uh, your experience, some lessons you've learned, and some uh, ideas that for other people today. Thank you so much for being with us. We appreciate you very much. Okay, thanks, Mike. You can hear me? Yes, very well, thank you. Yeah, I'm going to make the introduction, um, the request of my husband because of language 
uh, technologies. Um, so I'll just, like you've said, I come from Canada, from the Niagara region, and uh, we came to know homeschooling from there, obviously. But let's, uh, I'll just give you a rough overview of our situation. We live in Germany, and this is a tough, very tough country with regards to any sort of homeschooling, as you've said, and as you all know. Um, Germany is known to be the inventor of compulsory school education 300 years ago. For the past 100 years, um, compulsory, compulsory education can only be fulfilled by uh, attending a school building. So everybody in Germany really doesn't know anything about homeschooling or doesn't know anything about anything else than sending kids to a school until last year, of course. And homeschooling was really considered as something very strange, very weird. Uh, the last homeschooling for kids started in 2001, ended in 2006, the Conrad case, and the Constitutional Court decided against them. And since then, as you've said, the, the, the ruling or the jurisprudence, I guess you lawyers call it, we are lay lawyers, <laughs> and that has practically written, that has been written in stone since then. There was an attempt at lobbying parliamentarians after that in order to make a, you know, a grab at a majority, but that wasn't very successful. And as we all know, in a democracy, you need to be able to count to 50. So that was never really an alternative. But Germany has a long uh, tradition of freedom for private schools. And essentially, if the outcome of the education provided by a private school is deemed equivalent to that of public schools, they have to be recognized. And that's essentially what we've been doing. We operate a private school with only one day of attendance per week, almost like you would have in the U.S. as a weekly co-op. So when we've been fighting for getting this school officially recognized now for many years in order to take on students and for them to be able to meet the requirement of compulsory schooling in that way. So that is homeschooling for us at the moment. That's what's, I think Jonathan will probably, can give you a little more information on what's actually happening now. Well, we don't need to discuss the issue actually. Um, just um, we think that we can win the case. We are at the federal uh, administration court right now and facing then the constitution court, of course. So, but if somebody wants to start a court case, so that was maybe the question you, you sent me uh, to give maybe some advice for that. So I would advise, first of all, take care of the file. So if you go to court, the, you always have to have in the back of your head, you have to know the, the judge will decide on the basis of the file. So try to make the file in favor of your case. Secondly, what I would say, it's always hard to change a legal frame that is already made by the higher courts. So the uh, jurisprudence, you call it. It's always hard to change that. Maybe you, it's, all, it's sometimes better to, to make it matching or make you cause matching into that frame, let's say by an expert report or, or something else of education, maybe. So, so there, there we have to be creative and think about what can we do to matching it in or fitting it in into the legal frame there's, which is already there. I would say, all, first of all, you need persons that are really dedicated and motivated for the court. This was, that was a mistake we made in the beginning. We had a partnership with a Christian school, and we this had some advantages in, in Germany under the German private school law. But those, those, this organization was not as motivated and as dedicated to the cause as we were. So as soon as the cause got a, bit, a little bit hot with the uh, school administration, so they, they just kicked us out and let us 
sit in the rain then outside. So we never do that. But you always have to have persons that are really motivated and uh, dedicated to the cause. Um, and they think day and night about the, the case. And of course, they get new ideas and I would always say revelation about it. So that's really, uh, if you don't have a, a lawyer or attorney that is really uh, motivated and dedicated thing that the suggestions uh, and, and proposals to the attorney, you have to give them the information and studies and all of that stuff. So don't just sit, sit back and think the lawyer or the attorney can do everything. You have to be the person that is motivated and has, has to help out in the case. Uh, finally, I would say we need always to have in mind we ought to have to win in the courtroom of society. So it's always, always easier for a judge to decide in your favor if the public opinion is supportive or at least open for the issue. So that means we have to have some media attention, but always take care is a positive. It's better not to have too many media attention, but positive ones and to have so much attention. So that's what I would say. We always have to take care that we have some media people that are open for our case. And I guess you understood what I meant. Yes, Jonathan, we understood. Did, is that that's all you have to say for now? Irene, do you have anything else to add? No, just hang in there. <laughs> <laughs> Probably the best advice. I think that's a good place to I think that's a good place to close out our time together. Unfortunately, we had scheduled this maximum for two hours um, and we are right at the two hour mark. Um, we could talk about these issues for many more hours. Um, We've had some amazing panelists, and I just want to stop for just a minute uh, and just talk about what Jonathan and Irene said. I mean, the great wisdom that you have gained from this fight, Jonathan and Irene, and, you know, motivation, dedication, working with a lawyer. Uh, I know that all the lawyers who are listening right now are like saying, yes, the file. Clients who are organized, please, we want clients who are organized. And I know that you you guys are very organized and you've become more organized. But it's so true that, uh, you know, the lawyers are busy people doing lots of different things. And a client should not just sit back and expect the lawyer to do everything. And that is such good advice to to the homeschool leaders who might be watching this uh, webinar and this section of the webinar is, you know, you yes, the lawyers are important. They're going to do a lot of work, but you are just as important to the case by making a good file, good documentation, uh, finding expert witnesses, working with the expert witnesses, and helping the lawyer to create a case that will influence the judge. You talked about culture. So many other of the panelists have talked about culture. This is a cultural battle. It's about changing the way society thinks about education. Wow. That is a big at task, a very big task. I remember uh, the first time I started doing international homeschool work was with Germany starting in 2006, right after the ECHR decision in Conrad. And I realized, oh boy, this is going to be a very difficult situation with Germany because the culture is so against this idea. It's a foreign idea. And so you talked about the media uh, and working with media, that's so important, public relations. And as Mike Ferris talked about the link between litigation and legislation, he also talked about, uh, you know, making sure that we present homeschooling to society by showing our kids, by talking about what we're doing, why we're doing it, and not just hiding in the basement, which everybody thinks is what homeschoolers do, but certainly that isn't what any, virtually any homeschoolers do. So a lot of wisdom from uh, from you, Jonathan and Irene, and, and I want to thank you for being with us to close out our session. Uh, thank you, Mike Ferris, Alexandre uh, Moreira from Brazil, um, Lizzie and Lorcan from ADF International from Europe, Jose from Portugal. We've talked a lot about Europe. That's because it's a big fight in Europe uh, on this issue, uh, but there are fights in other areas too, uh, in, in Africa, in, uh, in Asia, and, and this, this isn't going away. Um, 
this is this is an important battle, and each one of you are serving in various capacities. And those of you who are listening, um, you know, hang in there, as Irene said. I think that's a great way for us to end our time together. Because here, you know, here's what I have said to any German homeschooling person who would listen to me, and it's my it's it's my charge to anyone listening now. If you give up, you will lose. But if you don't give up, you will win. The question is, who can last more? Parents, do we have more lasting power or the state? We're, I don't think the parents are going to give up. I don't know the state's going to give up. So as, uh, as the speakers have all said, this is a battle that's going to continue, and we have to think about it that way. And so what we're doing here is we're creating, we're creating structures and uh, we're, we're creating um, you know, organizations that are going to defend future generations and their rights to be able to homeschool. And so that's a very valuable and important thing. So thank you all for being with us. Thank you to the audience and to the, uh, who, who joined us today. It was a small audience who hung in there, but this is gonna, this is recorded and uh, it will get a lot of airtime. I know people are gonna be very interested in everything that was said here during this webinar. So on behalf of the Global Home Education Exchange Council that sponsored this, um, and with thanks to our sponsors, to the organizations that support GHEX, uh, to our staff, to you, uh, thank you and have a great day.